We're not going to be going into a lore lesson or anything again today. We are just going to be going over the second trailer briefly. Um, and then going through the Reddit AMA. Picking out the questions and answers that actually matter. Um, things that we would deem important versus minor questions of curiosity. So if you want, you can skip ahead from me watching the second trailer and chatting about it by a little bit. If not, you can just hang around and hear my commentary. Okay, so that's a prophet, a bunch of kneeling elithids. I see two spell jammers. There's a big elder brain behind him. I guess that kind of a, confirms the idea about something special entering society causing change. Maybe it's the demonic elithid that I speculated about. Who knows? The textures for their trailer is just amazing. I don't even think it was better than the first trailer looking at this detail versus the guy transforming. And the lady on the wall is a Githyanki. The question is, why is she there? Now we have an elithid pool. There's no elder brain, though. And the little hung tadpole. I'm digging the music. It's spot on for the scene. Ugh. It always kind of freaks me out that these things have teeth. <laughs> They're that tiny and they have teeth. They should crawl up under your brain. Interesting to note that for brain surgery, the fastest way to your brain is through your eye socket, actually. Hmm, there's some detail on those teeth. His little mantle shoulder headpiece thing. I don't even know what the proper name for it is anymore. It's, a, it's rather large, and I have no idea why those two guys are dead. I think one thing's for certain, though, this guy has to be strong to be able to control and not a load all by himself, because these things are, are supposed to be operated by a team of mind and delivers. But then again, creative liberties, um, they may not matter in this game. I love how big the Nautiloid is right now. Like, that's supposed to be a standard spaceship for them, and that thing is just giant. Open up some people for transformation. I have no idea what that tablet is. Actually, I tried to look it up. I couldn't figure it out. And then again, maybe I'm just bad at looking things up. why red drakes are helping to get the Yankee. Because normally they're inherently evil dragons. Not dumb, they just... It's weird that they would cooperate with anyone that's human because they just look down on people like that. I also think this means that the get the Yankee warrior that's inside of the Nautiloid is probably somebody special. Kidnapped, she was doing something she was supposed to, got caught by this guy, and now these guys are chasing after them, after him to rescue her. 
And as I mentioned in the last video, the I'm glad to see that the Nautiloid and the Lifted are actually zipping through and teleporting everywhere. And also mixes that they think it can do it too. I mean, they've been chasing and hunting them down for forever. So it makes sense to learn how to develop the same abilities to jump around everywhere. Now that also kind of confused me because I wouldn't think that liquefied pool of dead of liquid body parts would actually be flammable like that, or combust, combusted, combustion, that it could combust like that. You know, I, I didn't perceive it as like, you know, throwing a match on, you know, um, car, car gas or anything like that. But that was nice though. I enjoyed it. It was uh, a work of art. Okay, so here we have the Reddit AMA. <clears throat> I already kind of sorted it. I, I know I'm late. I still want to follow everything. I know I'm late. I'm sorry. <clears throat> so I kind of ordered everything based on the Q&A feature. And we'll try to touch on what I guess the site would deem as important. I'm going to dig through everything. I'm going to skip around here and there so that y'all are bored. And um, yeah, let's see what we can find. Okay, so it is the next day. I decided to do things a little differently. I dug through the AMA, I pulled out everything that seemed important, and I kind of organized it a little bit into general stuff, confirmations, and not confirmed. For general, we have predetermined automatic reactionary abilities, things like automatic spell shields, or even a chance to hit when somebody's moving next to you. The ammo they're going to be using for standard arrows and projectiles and stuff, we're just going to have limitless supply. The only time you have to worry about actual item stacking are for special ammo, like fire arrows and whatnot. Um, certain spells are going to have spell components. It's going to be their way to balance out the game for those abilities. Now, you can also experience origin character stories either playing as them, as we saw in the game demo, or just from playing with them. So even if you don't choose one and you make your own custom character, um, just having them in your party, you're going to experience everything that you would have experienced if you just picked them. There will be recognizable locations. Um, the Larian team did not specify what those were. One thing that was also talked about was that the bonus actions that we saw inside of the gameplay reveal, they're a little overpowered for what the player can do, uh, the shoving, jumping, all that stuff. So they are going to be working on that during the early access where the class features that will become invalidated by um, this imbalancing will actually become more desirable as we progress through early access in order to kind of fix that problem. Initiative roles for the party is actually going to be party based. This way everyone kind of goes at once versus the other team going at once. It's something they really want to push for and of course there's going to be concerns about it, but um, they're confident they're going to make it work. And just as a generality, they're going to make it so that everyone in the party will roll initiative like normal and whoever the highest role is, that'll count for the whole they also talked about the UI will be changing consistently during the course of early access. During the gameplay reveal, there were um, some placeholder stuff that we saw. They didn't specify what, but they did say that they're going to be changing it periodically throughout early access. Which is the Coast also just went ahead and told them that it is now canon that any humanoids can be transformed um, through the tadpoles and ceramorphoses. So the old lore that was talked about in a previous video about how like uh, shorter gnomes and other such creatures that can't exactly inhabit or be transformed otherwise it would kill the host and the tadpole those are allowed now just for the sake of um, kind of streamlining everything they also mentioned kind of loosely that the tadpoles they're not going to be functioning with their thermophoses they're not going to be functioning the way we would expect so i'm wondering with the changes that they're doing to the lore of the thermophoses and us and just telling us that they're not going to behave the way we expect. I wonder if maybe there's a possibility story-wise that they're going to be turning you, the character, into the messiah because it's something that was kind of mysterious that we saw. It wasn't an immediate transformation. And so I wonder maybe if what we saw in the second trailer, those were probably special tadpoles. I also talked about how uh, story-wise, whenever you're inside the city, finally, 
you can be heavily involved if you want with the actual politics, the threats, and the affairs of the city itself. Kind of like being in the middle of the Iron Throne and all that mess all over again. In addition to that, the story will also be a lot darker than what, than what we've seen before, with options to do some really terrible things. They also did say there's gonna be a lot of beautiful things in the game, but at the same time, there's gonna be a lot of dark tones that are gonna be outweighing what we've seen in the past. There will be some quests that are time sensitive, nothing was specified beyond that. Multiplayer should be available during early access, and early access will only be available on Steam and Stadia. Act 1 for the new game they talked about is going to actually be bigger than the Act 1 of Divinity Original Sin 2, and that the entire course of early access will be Act 1, however big it's going to be, but they're going to be releasing Act 1 in certain parts that didn't specify how frequent those are coming out, only that they're going to be chunking it here and there for the sake of um, development. All right, so now we have some confirmations that they talked about during the AMA. Your character's choices will matter. Party members will react to your choices, and there isn't going to be any true flavor text. Things like race, background, subclasses, etc. That stuff is going to actually matter and will actually influence what happens to you in the game. Character creation will have unique voice choices as well. And at the start, we will be getting elf, halfling, and dwarf sub-races to choose from. Now, if you're creating a custom character, instead of using Origin, each avatar will be granted special significance based on the player agency, so you'll be treated as a special protagonist regardless of your character choices. So, make whoever you want, you're still going to have a good experience going through all of it. So far, all Origin characters are confirmed to be our companions. So, everyone that we saw in the game trailer reveal, or even in the banner that they have on you know, Twitter and whatnot, those are going to be all of our companions, just like how we have a Jahir and Minsk and everyone else back in the day. We will also be able to have the ability to have non-origin companions, but they're going to be generic mercenaries. We will have the ability to customize them, and they will have full voice acting, but they're not going to have any story to go along with what's happening. Of course, romance is confirmed, that's something a lot of people are going to be excited for. Custom parties will be available at character creation screen as well. So you're not just jumping in with one person, you can just create a whole group of people and go in with a group of friends or just by yourself as a group. And surprisingly, they did confirm that uh, Baldur's Gate 1, Shadows of Am, and Throne of Baal are all going to connect to Baldur's Gate 3, saying that the events that took place in those previous games are all going to, in one way or another, lead up to the events of Baldur's Gate 3. Whether it's probably through hearsay or direct um, cause and correlation, we're going to be seeing the results of what happened as well as there's going to be returning characters, but they did not specify who, and they did not specify what their role is going to be. They didn't say whether they're going to be able to join your party again, what there is going to be an NPC you talk to, but they do have plans for returning characters. So that's, I mean, pick someone and just cross your fingers they're going to be in it, because they probably might be. So features and multi-classing are going to be a thing as well. The party size is going to be capped at four people this time around. They talked about the reason for four instead of six, or God forbid, you know, eight or ten or whatever. The reason for four is because it fits well with them kind of streamlining the entire fight process in general, so that things can feel a little quicker and actually um, flow a little bit better gameplay-wise. To start off with, our level cap is going to be level ten. There will be set pieces for loot. They didn't specify what they would be though. Items do have unique descriptions, just like in the old game. So we'll take a right click, see what the description is, and probably get a little story to go along with it. Magical item identification is confirmed, so we're going to have to hopefully find a mage that actually knows um, identify item. They also confirmed that because this is being tied to the entire D&D um, universe, there will also be cameos from the D&D campaigns, Murder and Baldur's Gate, and Descent into Avernus. I'm kind of happy about that. One thing I always thought that was really neat in the old games, that they're actually bringing back from Baldur's Gate 3, is whenever you're just you're out in the world, you're exploring a dungeon or something, you just find books. Not special books, just books. And sometimes they'll have like maybe three or five pages, sometimes they'll have like ten pages of just, you know, lore and stories about the world. And whether you liked them or not, I always kind of thought it was neat that they were just there throughout the world just for you to pick up whenever you wanted. Or hell, even collect. I mean, there's a lot of them. Alright, things are not confirmed. Um... What areas are available, they did not confirm what those are yet. And as far as Siege of Dragonspear content and the Enhanced Edition extra content, like Nira and Dorne and their stories, 
there is no confirmations on what they're going to be touching those or not yet. There is no confirmation on legendary characters like Drizzt making a cameo yet. They're probably trying to decide who they want to use and where, but they didn't want to say yes right away in case it gets a flat out no altogether. There is no early access date. They said multiple times throughout the AMA that it will release when it's ready. And for any of you who were a little excited about the Vampire Origin character getting to make your own vampire, they did confirm that things like vampires and other undead, that you're not going to be able to create those customized for your own benefits in the game. Legendary weapons, like what we kind of got to see inside of Phone of Ball, those are a bit of a toss-up at the moment. They don't know yet what they want to do with that. And of course, there is no current plans for DLC. I'm certain something will come along after the game releases and it becomes a huge success. And until then, you know, try to think up what that might be. I think it might be fun to see um, people's takes on what the DLC for an a, for a um, possibly giant elithid campaign for Blood Gate 3 is going to be. Because, I mean, it could be literally anything at this point. We're picking up an old story and we're integrating it into the universe and it just, it can go any direction. Alright, that was my short little um, coverage on the second trailer and the Reddit AMA. I know I'm definitely still still behind, but you know, I want to try. And for anyone who likes me, I'm going to be here. I'm going to keep trying. And I hope I can, you know, entertain you along the way. Until then, I'll try to be active on Twitter and all that fun stuff.